The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H. P. Lovecraft in Chapter One During the winter of 1927 and 28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting, under suitable precautions, of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious numbers of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials, or even definite charges, were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons, but nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organizations were met with long confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched, since the low black reef lies a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbor. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying and half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really do very little, for wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbors off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last I am going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain, are so thorough that no public harms have a shock of repulsion could ever accrue from a hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of the whole tale has been told, even to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper. For my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16th, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain, but now that it is an old story, with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumored and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first time, and, so far, last. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was traveling by train, trolley, and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, 
and it was only at the station ticket office, when I demurred at the high fare, that I learned about Innsmouth. The stout, shrewd-faced agent whose speech shewed him to be no local man seemed sympathetic toward my efforts at economy, and made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. "'You could take that old bus, I suppose,' he said with a certain hesitation. "'But it ain't thought much of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, and so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth fellow, Joe Sargent, but never gets any custom from here. Or Arkham either, I guess. Wonder if he keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it. Nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, front of Hammond's drugstore, at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. unless they change lately. Looks like a terrible rattletrap. Never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of Shadow Dinsmith. Any reference to a town not shewn on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbors must, I thought, be at least rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there, and so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate, and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Innsmouth? Well, it's a queer kind of town, down at the mouth of the Manuset. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812. But all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now. B and M never went through, and the branch line from Rowley was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess, and no business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly either here or in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left now except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing, and old man Marsh, who owns it, must be richer and closest. Queer old duck, though, and sticks mighty close in his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight. Grandson of Captain Obed Marsh, who founded the business. His mother seems to have been some kind of foreigner. They say a South Sea Islander. So everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl fifty years ago. He always do that about Innsmouth people. And folks here and hereabouts always try to cover up any Innsmouth blood they have in them. But Marsh's children and grandchildren look just like anyone else, so far as I can see. I've had them pointed out to me here, though, come to think of it, the elder children don't seem to be around lately. Never saw the old man. And why is everybody so down on Innsmouth? Well, young fellow, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. They're hard to get started, but once they do get started, they never let up. They've been telling things about Innsmouth, whispered mostly, for the last hundred years, I guess, and I gather they're more scared than anything else. And some of the stories would make you laugh about old Captain Marsh diving bargains with the devil and bringing the imps out of hell to live in Innsmouth, or about some kind of devil worship and awful sacrifices in some place near the wharves that People stumbled on around 1845 or thereabouts. But I come from Panton, Vermont, and that kind of story don't go down with me. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old-timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time, and never much below it. But of that, you could hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on that reef sprawled about or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. It's a rugged, uneven thing, a good bit over a mile out, and toward the end of shipping days, sailors used to make big detours just to avoid it. That is, sailors that didn't hail from Innsmouth. One of the things they had against old Captain Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night when the tide was right. Maybe he did, for I dare say the rock formation was interesting and it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot. 
and may be finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. The fact is, I guess on the whole, it was really the captain that gave the bad reputation to the reef. That was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth was carried off. They never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. It surely was bad enough. There was riots over it and all sorts of ghastly doings that I don't believe ever got outside of town. And it left the place in awful shape. Never came back. There can't be more than 300 or 400 people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply race prejudice. And I don't say I'm blaming those that hold it. I hate those Innsmouth folks myself. And I wouldn't care to go to their town. Suppose you know. Though I can see you're a Westerner by your talk. What a lot our New England ships used to have to do with queer ports in Africa, Asia, the South Seas, and everywhere else. And what queer kinds of people they sometimes brought back them. You probably heard about the sailor man that came home with a Chinese wife. And maybe you know there's still a bunch of Fiji Islanders somewhere on Cape Cod. Well, there must be something like that back of the Innsmouth people. The place always was badly cut off from the rest of the country by marshes and creeks, and we can't be sure about the ins and outs of the matter, but it's pretty clear that old Captain Marsh must have brought home some odd specimens when he had all three of his ships in commission back in the twenties and thirties. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sargent if you take his bus, some of them have queer narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starry eyes that never seem to shut, and their skin ain't quite right. Rough and scabby, and the sides of the necks are all shriveled or creased up. Get bald, too. Very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Nobody around here or in Arkham or Ipswich will have anything to do with them, and they act kind of oofish themselves when they come to town, or when anyone tries to fish on their grounds. Queer how fish are always thick off Innsmouth Harbor when they ain't anywhere else around. But just try to fish there yourself and see how the folks chase you off. Those people used to come here on the railroad, walking and taking the train at Rowley after the branch was dropped. But now they use that bus. Yes, there's a hotel in Innsmouth, called the Gilman House, but I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay over here and take the ten o'clock bus tomorrow morning. Then you can get an evening bus there for our committee at o'clock. There was a factory inspector who stopped at the Gilman a couple of years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems to get a queer crowd there. This fellow heard voices in other rooms, though most of them was empty. It gave him the shivers. It was foreign talk, he thought. But he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that, voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural. Slopping-like, he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep. Just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fella, Casey his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmouth folks watched him and seemed kind of on guard. He found the Marsh Refinery a queer place. It's an old mill in the lower falls, the man you said. What he said tallied up with what I'd heard. Books in bad shape and no clear account of any kind of dealings. You know, it's always been a kind of mystery where the marshes get the gold they refine. They've never seemed to do much buying in that line, but... Years ago, they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. Used to be talk of a queer foreign kind of jewelry that the sailors and refiner men sometimes sold on the sly, or that was seen once or twice on some of the marsh women folks. People allowed maybe old Captain Obed traded for it in some heathen port, especially since he was always ordering stacks of glass beads and trinkets such as seafaring men used to get for native trade. Others thought, and still think, he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. But here's a funny thing. 
The old captain been dead these sixty years, and there ain't been a good sized ship out of the place since the Civil War. But just the same, the marshes still keep on buying a few of those native trade things. Most are glass and rubber gugars, they tell me. Maybe the Innsmouth folks like them to look at themselves. God knows they've got to be about as bad as South Sea cannibals and Guinea savages. That plague of 46 must have taken off the best blood in the place. Anyway, they're a doubtful lot now. And the marshes and the other rich folks are as bad as any. As I told you, there probably ain't more than 400 people in the whole town in spite of all the streets they say there are. I guess they're what they call white trash down south. Lawless and sly and full of secret doings. They get a lot of fish and lobsters and do exporting by truck. Queer how the fish swarm right there and nowhere else. Nobody can ever keep track of these people, and state school officials and census men have a devil of a time. You can bet that prying strangers ain't welcome around Innsmouth. I've heard personally of more than one business or government man that's disappeared there, and there's loose talk of one who went crazy and is out of Denver's now. They must have fixed up some awful scare for that fellow. That's why I wouldn't go at night if I was you. I've never been there and have no wish to go, but I guess a daytime trip couldn't hurt you, even though the people hereabouts will advise you not to make it. If you're just sightseeing and looking for old-time stuff, Innsmouth ought to be quite a place for you. And so I spent a part of that evening at the Newburyport Public Library, looking up data about Innsmouth. When I had tried to question the natives in the shops, the lunchroom, the garages, and the fire station, I had found them even harder to get started than the ticket agent had predicted, and realized that I could not spare the time to overcome their first instinctive reticences. They had a kind of obscure suspiciousness, as if there was something amiss with anyone too much interested in Innsmouth. At the YMCA where I was stopping, the clerk merely discouraged my going to such a dismal, decadent place and the people of the library shoot much the same attitude. Clearly, in the eyes of the educated, Innsmouth was merely an exaggerated case of civic degeneration. The Essex County histories in the library shelves had very little to say, except that the town was founded in 1643, noted for shipbuilding before the Revolution, a seat of great marine prosperity in the early 19th century, and later a minor factory center using the manuset as power. The epidemic and riots of 1846 were very sparsely treated, as if they formed a discredit to the country. References to decline were few, though the significance of the later record was unmistakable. After the Civil War, all industrial life was confined to the Marsh Refining Company, and the marketing of gold ingots formed the only remaining bit of major commerce aside from the eternal fishing. That fishing paid less and less as the price of the commodity fell, and large-scale corporations offered competition. But there was never a dearth of fish around Innsmouth Harbor. Foreigners seldom settled there. And there was some discreetly veiled evidence that a number of Poles and Portuguese who had tried it had been scattered in a peculiarly drastic fashion. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to the strange jewelry vaguely associated with Innsmouth. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of specimens in the museum at Miskatonic University at Arkham and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society. The fragmentary descriptions of these things were bald and prosaic, but they hinted to me an undercurrent of persistent strangeness. Something about them seemed so odd and provocative that I could not put them out of my mind, and despite the relative lateness of the hour I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, queerly proportioned thing, evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby, and after a brief explanation, that ancient gentleman woman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building, since the hour was not outrageously late. The collection was a notable one indeed, but in my present mood I had eyes for nothing but the bizarre object which glistened in the corner cupboard under the electric lights. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. 
Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough. A sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front, and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird lighter lustrousness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect, and one could have spent hours in studying the striking and puzzling, untraditional designs, some simply geometrical and some plainly marine, chased or molded in high relief on its surface with a craftsmanship of incredible skill and grace. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me, and in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first I decided that it was the queer, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. It clearly belonged to some settled technique of infinite maturity and perfection, yet that technique was utterly remote from any, eastern or western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard of or seen exemplified. It was as if the worksmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half Batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history, as related by Miss Tilton. It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum at a shop in State Street in 1873 by a drunken Innsmouth man shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labeled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton, comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate horde discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. This view was surely not weakened by the insistent offers of purchase at a high price, which the Marshes began to make as soon as they knew of its presence, and which they repeated to this day, despite the Society's unvarying determination not to sell. As the good lady shooed me out of the building, she made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh Fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude toward Shadow Dinsmith, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale, and she assured me that the rumors of devil worship were partly justified by a peculiar secret cult which had gained force there and engulfed all the Orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before, at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on New Church Green. All this, to the pious Miss Tilton, formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation, but to me it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal, and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away. 
Chapter 2 Shortly before ten the next morning, I stood with one small valise in front of Hammond's drugstore in Old Market Square waiting for the Innsmouth bus. As the hour for its arrival drew near, I noticed a general drift of loungers to other places up the street, or to the ideal lunch across the square. Evidently the ticket agent had not exaggerated the dislike which local people bore toward Innsmouth and its denizens. In a few moments a small motor coach of extreme decrepitude and dirty gray color rattled down State Street, made a turn, and drew up at the curb beside me. I felt immediately that it was the right one, a guess which the half-illegible sign on the windshield, Arkham, Innsmouth, Newburyport, soon verified. There were only three passengers, dark, unkempt men of sullen visage and somewhat youthful cast, and when the vehicle stopped they clumsily shambled out and began walking up State Street in a silent, almost furtive fashion. The driver also alighted, and I watched him as he went into the drugstore to make some purchase. This, I reflected, must be the Joe Sargent mentioned by the ticket agent, and even before I noticed any details, there spread over me a wave of spontaneous aversion which could be neither checked nor explained. It suddenly struck me as very natural that the local people should not wish to ride on a bus owned and driven by this man, or to visit any oftener than possible the habitat of such a man and his kinsfolk. When the driver came out of the store I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil inspiration. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes wearing a frayed gray golf cap. His age was perhaps thirty-five, but the odd deep creases on the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to wink, a flat nose, a receding forehead, and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse, poured grayish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches, and in places the surface seemed queerly irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual grayish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure, and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait, and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit them. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks, and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. Just what foreign blood was in him I could not even guess. His oddities certainly did not look Asiatic, Polynesian, Levantine, or Negroid, yet I could see why the people found him alien. I myself would have thought of biological degeneration rather than alienage. I was sorry when I saw that there would be no other passengers in the bus. Somehow I did not like the idea of riding alone with his driver. But as leaving time obviously approached, I conquered my qualms and followed the man aboard, extending him a dollar bill and murmuring the single word, Innsmouth. He looked curiously at me for a second as he returned forty cents change without speaking. I took a seat far behind him, but on the same side of the bus, since I wished to watch the shore during the journey. At length the decrepit vehicle started with a jerk and rattled noisily past the old brick buildings of State Street amidst a cloud of vapor from the exhaust. Glancing at the people on the sidewalks, I thought I detected in them a curious wish to avoid looking at the bus, or at least a wish to avoid seeming to look at it. Then we turned to the left into High Street, where the going was smoother, flying by stately old mansions of the early Republic and still older colonial farmhouses, passing the Lower Green and Parker River, and finally emerging into a long, monotonous stretch of open shore country. The day was warm and sunny, but the landscape of sand, sedge grass, and stunted shrubbery became more and more desolate as we proceeded. 
Out the window I could see the blue water and the sandy line of Plum Island, and we presently drew very near the beach as our narrow road veered off from the main highway to Rowley and Ipswich. There were no visible houses, and I could tell by the state of the road that traffic was very light hereabouts. The small, weather-worn telephone poles carried only two wires. Now and then we crossed crude wooden bridges over tidal creeks that wound far inland and promoted the general isolation of the region. Once in a while I noticed dead stumps and crumbling foundation walls above the drifting sand, and recalled the old tradition quoted in one of the histories I had read, that this was once a fertile and thickly settled countryside. The change, it was said, came simultaneously with the Innsmouth epidemic of 1846, and was thought by simple folk to have a dark connection with hidden forces of evil. Actually, it was caused by the unwise cutting of woodlands near the shore, which robbed the soil of its best protection and opened the waver waves of wind-blown sand. At last we lost sight of Plum Island and saw the vast expanse of the open Atlantic on our left. Our narrow course began to climb steeply, and I felt a singular sense of disquiet in looking at the lonely crest ahead where the rutted roadway met the sky. It was as if the bus were about to keep on in its ascent, leaving the sane earth altogether and merging with the unknown arcana of upper air and cryptical sky. The smell of the sea took on ominous implications, and the silent driver's bent, rigid back and narrow head became more and more hateful. As I looked at him, I saw that the back of his head was almost as hairless as his face, having only a few straggling yellow strands upon a gray, scabrous surface. Then we reached the crest and beheld the outspread valley beyond, where the Manuset joins the sea just north of the long line of cliffs that culminate in Kingsport Head and veer off toward Cape Ann. On the far, misty horizon I could just make out the dizzy profile of the head, topped by the queer, ancient house of which so many legends are told, but for the moment all my attention was captured by the nearer panorama just below me. I had, I realized, come face to face with rumor shadowed Innsmouth. It was a town of wide extent and dense construction, yet one with a portentous dearth of visible life. From the tangle of chimney pots scarcely a wisp of smoke came, and the three tall steeples loomed stark and unpainted against the seaward horizon. One of them was crumbling down at the top, and in that and another there were only black, gaping holes where clock dials should have been. The vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peaked gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay, and as we approached along the now descending road I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. There were some large square Georgian houses, too, with hipped roofs, cupolas, and railed widow's walks. These were mostly well back from the water, and one or two seemed to be in moderately sound condition. Stretching inland from among them, I saw the rusted, grass-grown line of the abandoned railway, with leaning telegraph poles now devoid of wires, and the half-obscured lines of the old carriage roads to Rowley and Ipswich. The decay was worst, close to the waterfront, though in its very midst I could spy the white belfry of a fairly well-preserved brick structure which looked like a small factory. The harbor, long clogged with sand, was enclosed by an ancient stone breakwater, on which I could begin to discern the minute forms of a few seated fishermen, and at whose end were what looked like the foundations of a bygone lighthouse. A sandy tongue had formed inside this barrier, and upon it I saw a few decrepit cabins, moored dories, and scattered lobster pots. The only deep water seemed to be where the river poured out past the belfried structure and turned southward to join the ocean at the breakwater's end. Here and there the ruins of wharves jutted out from the shore to end in indeterminate rottenness, those farthest south seeming the most decayed. And far out at sea, despite a high tide, I glimpsed a long black line scarcely rising above the water, yet carrying a suggestion of old latent malignancy. This, I knew, must be Devil Reef. As I looked, a subtle, curious sense of beckoning seemed 
super added to the grim repulsion, and oddly enough, I found this overtone more disturbing than the primary impression. We met no one on the road, but presently began to pass deserted farms in varying stages of ruin. Then I noticed a few inhabited houses with rags stuffed at the broken windows and shells and dead fish lying about the littered yards. Once or twice I saw listless-looking people working in barren gardens or digging clams on the fishy-smelling beach below, and groups of dirty, simian-visaged children laying around weed-grown doorsteps. Somehow these people seemed more disquieting than the dismal buildings, for almost every one had a certain peculiarity of face and motion which I instinctively disliked without being able to define or comprehend. For a second, I thought this typical physique suggested some picture I had seen, perhaps in a book, under circumstances of particular horror melancholy. But this pseudo-recollection passed very quickly. As the bus reached a lower level, I began to catch the steady note of a waterfall through the unnatural stillness. The leaning, unpainted houses grew thicker, lined both sides of the road, and displayed more urban tendencies than did those we were leaving behind. The panorama ahead had contracted to a street scene, and in spots I could see where cobblestone pavement and stretches of brick sidewalk had formerly existed. All the houses were apparently deserted, and there were occasional gaps where tumble-down chimneys and cellar walls told of buildings that had collapsed. Pervading everything was the most nauseous fishy odor imaginable. Soon, cross streets and junctions began to appear, those on the left leading to shoreward realms of unpaved squalor and decay, while those on the right shewed vistas of departed grandeur. So far, I had seen no people in the town, but there now came signs of a sparse habitation, curtained windows here and there, and an occasional battered motor car at the curb. Pavement and sidewalks were increasingly well-defined, and though most of the houses were quite old, wood and brick structures of the early 19th century, they were obviously kept fit for habitation. As an amateur antiquarian, I almost lost my olfactory disgust and my feeling of menace and repulsion amidst this rich, unaltered survival from the past. But I was not to reach my destination without one very strong impression of poignantly disagreeable quality. The bus had come to a sort of open concourse or radial point with churches on two sides and the bedraggled remains of a circular green in the center. And I was looking at a large pillared hall on the right-hand junction ahead. The structure's once white paint was now gray and peeling, and the black and gold sign on the pediment was so faded that I could only with difficulty make out the words Esoteric Order of Dagon. This, then, was the former Masonic Hall now given over to a degraded cult. As I strained to decipher this inscription, my notice was distracted by the raucous tones of a cracked bell across the street, and I quickly turned to look out the window on my side of the coach. The sound came from a squat, towered stone church of manifestly later date than most of the houses, built in a clumsy Gothic fashion and having a disproportionately high basement, with shutter windows. Though the hands of its clock were missing on the side I glimpsed, I knew that those hoarse strokes were telling the hour of eleven. Then suddenly all thoughts of time were blotted out by an onrushing image of sharp intensity and unaccountable horror which had seized me before I knew what it really was. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside, and as I looked, a certain object crossed, or seemed to cross that dark rectangle, burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare which was all the more maddening because analysis could not show a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, the first except the driver that I had seen since entering the compact part of the town and had I been in a steadier mood, I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realized a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments doubtless introduced since the Order of Dagon had modified the ritual of the local churches. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of the bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore, an almost exact duplicate of the one Miss Tilton had shewn me the previous evening. 
This, acting on my imagination, had supplied namelessly sinister qualities to the indeterminate face and robed shambling form beneath it. There was not, I soon decided, any reason why I should have felt that shuddering touch of evil super-memory. Was it not natural that a local mystery cult should adopt among its regimentals a unique type of headdress made familiar to the community in some strange way? Perhaps as treasure trove? A very thin sprinkling of repellent-looking youngish people now became visible on the sidewalks, lone individuals in silent knots of two or three. The lower floors of the crumbling houses sometimes harbored small shops with dingy signs, and I noticed a parked truck or two as we rattled along. The sound of waterfalls became more and more distinct, and presently I saw a fairly deep river gorge ahead, spanned by a wide, iron-railed highway bridge beyond which a large square opened out. As we clanked over the bridge, I looked out on both sides and observed some factory buildings on the edge of the grassy bluff, or part way down. The water far below was very abundant, and I could see two vigorous sets of falls upstream on my right, and at least one downstream on my left. From this point the noise was quite deafening. Then we rolled into the large semicircular square across the river and drew up on the right-hand side in front of a tall, cupola-crowned building with remnants of yellow paint and with a half-effaced sign proclaiming it to be the Gilman House. I was glad to get out of that bus and at once proceeded to check my valise in the shabby hotel lobby. There was only one person in sight, an elderly man without what I had come to call the Innsmouth look, and I decided not to ask him any of the questions which bothered me, remembering that odd things had been noticed in this hotel. Instead, I strolled out on the square from which the bus had already gone, and studied the scene minutely and appraisingly. One side of the cobblestoned open space was the straight line of the river. The other was a semicircle of slant-roofed brick buildings of about the 1800 period, from which several streets radiated away to the southeast, south, and southwest. Lamps were depressingly few and small, all low-powered incandescents, and I was glad that my plans called for departure before dark, even though I knew the moon would be bright. The buildings were all in fair condition, and included perhaps a dozen shops in current operation, of which one was a grocery of the first national chain, others a dismal restaurant, a drug store, and a wholesale fish dealer's office, and still another at the eastern extremity of the square near the river, an office of the town's only industry, the Marsh Refining Company. There were perhaps ten people visible, and four or five automobiles and motor trucks stood scattered about. I did not need to be told that this was the civic center of Innsmouth. Eastward, I could catch blue glimpses of the harbor against which rose the decaying remains of three once beautiful Georgian steeples. And toward the shore on the opposite bank of the river, I saw the white belfry surmounting what I took to be the marsh refinery. For some reason or other, I chose to make my first inquiries at the chain grocery, whose personnel was not likely to be native to Innsmouth. I found a solitary boy of about seventeen in charge, and was pleased to note the brightness and affability which promised cheerful information. He seemed exceptionally eager to talk, and I soon gathered that he did not like the place, its fishy smell, or its furtive people. A word with any outsider was a relief to him. He hailed from Arkham, boarded with a family who came from Ipswich, and went back home whenever he got a moment off. His family did not like him to work in Innsmouth, but the chain had transferred him there, and he did not wish to give up his job. There was, he said, no public library or chamber of commerce in Innsmouth, but I could probably find my way about. The street I had come down was Federal. West of that were the fine old residence streets, Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams, and east of it were the shoreward slums, it was in these slums along Main Street that I would find the old Georgian churches, but they were all long abandoned. I would be well not to make myself too conspicuous in such neighborhoods, especially north of the river, since the people were sullen and hostile. Some strangers had even disappeared. 
Certain spots were almost forbidden territory, as he had learned at considerable cost. One must not, for example, linger much around the Marsh Refinery, or around any of the still-used churches, or around the pillared order of Dagon Hall at New Church Green. Those churches were very odd, all violently disavowed by their respective denominations elsewhere, and apparently using the queerest kind of ceremonials in clerical vestments. Their creeds were heterodox and mysterious, involving hints of certain marvelous transformations leading to bodily immortality of a sort on this earth. The youth's young pastor, Dr. Wallace of Asbury, M.E. Church in Arkham, had gravely urged him not to join any church in Innsmouth. As for the Innsmouth people, the youth hardly knew what to make of them. They were as furtive and seldom seen as animals that live in burrows, and one could hardly imagine how they passed the time apart from their desultory fishing. Perhaps, judging from the quantities of bootleg liquor they consumed, they lay for most of the daylight hours in an alcoholic stupor. They seemed sullenly banded together in some sort of fellowship and understanding, despising the world as if they had access to other and preferable spheres of entity. Their appearance, especially those staring, unwinking eyes which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough, and their voices were disgusting. It was awful to hear them chanting in their churches at night, and especially during their main festivals or revivals, which fell twice a year on April 30th and October 31st. They were very fond of the water, and swam a great deal in both river and harbor. Swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common, and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. When one came to think of it, it was generally only rather young people who were seen about in public, and of these the oldest were apt to be the most tainted-looking. When exceptions did occur, they were mostly persons with no trace of aberrancy, like the old clerk at the hotel. One wondered what became of the bulk of the older folk, and whether the Innsmouth look were not a strange and insidious disease phenomenon which increased its hold as years advanced. Only a very rare affliction, of course, could bring about such a vast and radical anatomical change in a single individual after maturity. Changes involving osseous factors as basic as the shape of the skull. But then, even this aspect was no more baffling and unheard of than the visible features of the malady as a whole. It would be hard, the youth implied, to form any real conclusions regarding such a matter, since one never came to know the natives personally, no matter how long one might live in Innsmouth. The youth was certain that many specimens, even worse than the worst visible ones, were kept locked indoors in some places. People sometimes heard the queer signs of sounds. The tottering waterfront hovels north of the river were repeatedly connected by hidden tunnels, being thus a veritable warren of unseen abnormalities. What kind of foreign blood, if any, these beings had, it was impossible to tell. They sometimes kept certain especially repulsive characters out of sight when government agents and others from the outside world came to town. It would be of no use, my informant said, to ask the natives anything about the place. The only one who would talk was a very aged but normal-looking man who lived at the boar house on the north rim of the town and spent his time walking about or lounging around the fire station. This hoary character, Zadok Allen, was ninety-six years old and somewhat touched in the head, besides being the town drunkard. He was a strange, furtive creature who constantly looked over his shoulder as if afraid of something, and when sober could not be persuaded to talk at all with strangers. He was, however, unable to resist any offer of his favorite poison, and once drunk would furnish the most astonishing fragments of whispered reminiscence. After all, though, little useful data could be gained from him, since his stories were all insane, incomplete hints of impossible marvels and horrors which could have no source save in his own disordered fancy. Nobody ever believed him, but the natives did not like him to drink and talk with strangers, and it was not always safe to be seen questioning him. It was probably from him that some of the wildest popular whispers and delusions were derived. Several non-native residents had reported monstrous glimpses from time to time, but between old Zadok's tales and the malformed denizens, it was no wonder such illusions were current. None of the non-natives ever stayed out late at night, there being a widespread impression that it was not wise to do so. 
Besides, the streets were loathsomely dark. As for business, the abundance of fish was certainly almost uncanny, for the natives were taking less and less advantage of it. Moreover, prices were falling and competition was growing. Of course, the town's real business was the refinery, whose commercial office was on the square only a few doors east of where we stood. Old Man Marsh was never seen, but sometimes went to the works in a closed, curtained car. There were all sorts of rumors about how Marsh had come to look. He had once been a great dandy, and people said he still wore the frock-coated finery of the Edwardian age, curiously adapted to certain deformities. His sons had formerly conducted the office in the square, but latterly they had been keeping out of sight a good deal and leaving the brunt of affairs to the younger generation. The sons and their sisters had come to look very queer, especially the elder ones, and it was said that their health was failing. One of the Marsh daughters was a repellent, reptilian-looking woman who wore an excess of weird jewelry, clearly the same exotic tradition as that to which the strange tiara belonged. My informant had noticed it many times, and had heard it spoken of as coming from some secret horde, either of pirates or of demons. The clergyman, or priests, or whatever they were called nowadays, also wore this kind of ornament as a headdress, but one seldom caught glimpses of them. Other specimens the youth had not seen, though many were rumored to exist around Innsmouth. The marshes, together with the other three gently bred families of the town, the Waits, the Gilmans, and the Elliots, were all very retiring. They lived in immense houses along Washington Street, and several were reputed to harbor in concealment, certain living kinsfolk whose personal aspect forbade public view, and whose deaths had been reported and recorded. Warning me that many of the street signs were down, the youth drew for my benefit a rough but ample and painstaking sketch map of the town's salient features. After a moment's study, I felt sure that it would be of great help, and pocketed it with profuse thanks. Disliking the dinginess of the single restaurant I had seen, I bought a fair supply of cheese crackers and ginger wafers to serve as a lunch later on. My program, I decided, would be to thread the principal streets, talk with any non-natives I might encounter, and catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham. The town, I could see, formed a significant and exaggerated example of communal decay, but being no sociologist, I would limit my serious observations to the field of architecture. Thus I began my systematic, though half-bewildered tour of Innsmouth's narrow, shadow-blighted ways. Crossing the bridge and turning toward the roar of the lower falls, I passed close to the marsh refinery, which seemed oddly free from the noise of industry. This building stood on the steep river bluff near a bridge and an open confluence of streets which I took to be the earliest civic center, displaced after the revolution by the present town square. Recrossing the gorge on the main street bridge, I struck a region of utter desertion which somehow made me shudder. Collapsing huddles of, gam of gambra roofs formed a jagged and fantastic skyline, above which rose the ghoulish, decapitated steeple of an ancient church. Some houses along Main Street were tenanted, but most were tightly boarded up. Down unpaved side streets I saw the black gaping windows of deserted hovels, many of which leaned at perilous and incredible angles through the sinking of part of the foundations. Those windows stared so spectrally that it took courage to turn eastward toward the rotter front. Certainly, the terror of a deserted house swells in geometrical rather than arithmetical progression as houses multiply to form a city of stark desolation. The sight of such endless avenues of fishy-eyed vacancy and death, and the thought of such linked infinities of black brooding compartments given over to cobwebs and memories and the conqueror worm start up vestigial fears and aversions that are not even the stoutest philosophy can averse. Fish Street was as deserted as Maine, though it differed in having many brick and stone warehouses still in excellent shape. Water Street was almost its duplicate, save that there were great seaward gaps where wharves had been. Not a living thing did I see except for the scattered fishermen on the distant breakwater. 
and not a sound did I hear save the lapping of the harbor tides and the roar of the falls in the Manuset. The town was getting more and more on my nerves, and I looked behind me furtively as I picked my way back over the tottering Water Street Bridge. The Fish Street Bridge, according to the sketch, was in ruins. North of the river there were traces of squalid life, active fish-packing houses in Water Street, smoking chimneys and patched roofs here and there, occasional sounds from indeterminate sources, and infrequent shambling forms in the dismal streets and unpaved lanes. But I seemed to find this even more oppressive than the southerly desertion. For one thing, the people were more hideous and abnormal than those near the center of the town, so that I was several times evilly reminded of something utterly fantastic which I could not quite place. Undoubtedly the alien strain in the Innsmouth folk was stronger here than farther inland, unless indeed the Innsmouth look were disease rather than a blood strain, in which case this district might be held to harbor the more advanced cases. One detail that annoyed me was the distribution of the few faint sounds I heard. They ought naturally to have come wholly from the visibly inhabited houses, yet in reality were often strongest inside the most rigidly boarded up facades. There were creakings, scurryings, and hoarse, doubtful noises, and I thought uncomfortably about the hidden tunnel suggested by the grocery boy. Suddenly I found myself wondering what the voices of those denizens would be like. I had heard no speech so far in this quarter, and was unaccountably anxious not to do so. Pausing only long enough to look at two fine but ruinous old churches at Main and Church Streets, I hastened out of that vile waterfront slum. My next logical goal was New Church Green, but somehow or other I could not bear to repass the church in whose basement I had glimpsed the inexplicably frightening form of that strangely diademed priest or pastor. Besides, the grocery youth had told me that the churches, as well as the Order of Dagon Hall, were not advisable neighborhoods for strangers. Accordingly, I kept north along Main to Martin, then turning inland, crossing Federal Street safely north of the Green, and entering the decayed patrician neighborhood of Northern Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams Streets. Though these stately old avenues were ill-surfaced and unkempt, their elm-shaded dignity had not entirely departed. Mansion after mansion claimed my gaze, most of them decrepit and boarded up amidst neglected grounds, but one or two in each street shewing signs of occupancy. In Washington Street there was a row of four or five in excellent repair, and with finely tended lawns and gardens, the most sumptuous of these, with wide terraced parterres extending back the whole way to Lafayette Street, I took to be the home of Old Man Marsh, the afflicted refinery owner. In all these streets no living thing was visible, and I wondered at the complete absence of cats and dogs from Innsmouth. Another thing which puzzled and disturbed me, even in some of the best-preserved mansions, was the tightly shuttered condition of many third-story and attic windows. Furtiveness and secretiveness seemed universal in this hushed city of alienage and death, and I could not escape the sensation of being watched from ambush on every hand by sly, staring eyes that never shut. I shivered as the cracked stroke of three sounded from a belfry on my left. Too well did I recall the squat church from which those notes came. Following Washington Street toward the river, I now faced a new zone of former industry and commerce, noting the ruins of a factory head, and seeing others, with the traces of an old railway station and covered railway bridge beyond, up the gorge on my right. The uncertain bridge, now before me, was posted with a warning sign but I took the risk and crossed again to the south bank, where traces of life reappeared. Furtive, shambling creatures stared cryptically in my direction, and more normal faces eyed me coldly and curiously. Hinsmith was rapidly becoming intolerable, and I turned down Payne Street toward the square in the hope of getting some vehicle to take me to Arkham before the still distant starting time of that sinister bus. It was then that I saw the tumble-down fire station on my left, and noticed the red-faced, bushy-bearded, watery-eyed old man in nondescript rags, 
who sat on a bench in front of it, talking with a pair of unkempt but not abnormal-looking firemen. This, of course, must be Zadok Allen, the half-crazed licorice nonagenarian whose tales of old Innsmouth in its shadow were so hideous and incredible.